Hi, welcome to this webinar. My name is Susana Carneiro. I am currently the executive director of Centro Pinos, that could be translated to English as Pine Center. And we are a Portuguese NGO focused on pine. So in Centro Pinos, we are always striving to learn more about pine silviculture. And uh, one of the obvious ways to do this is to reach out to colleagues in other parts of the world and ask them to share their knowledge and experience with us. We realize other foresters and researchers could benefit from this. And so we decided to promote an international webinar series that uh, has the aim to identify international success factors in pine silviculture. We found in UFRO the ideal uh, international partner for this, uh, particularly through the Ecology and Pine Silviculture Unit. And uh, I invite Teresa Fonseca, that will be addressing you as the coordinator of this unit, to make a short presentation about UFRO. Hi, Teresa. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the first session in the series of webinars organized by the Pinus Center and the UFRO uh, Forest Ecology and Silviculture Unit of Pine. For those not familiar with UFRO, this is an international organization of forest science research institutes with about 600 members from more than 100 countries. A summary will be shared with you, with you through mail uh, tomorrow. I thank the Pinus Center and the, its director, Susana Carneiro, for the challenge launched to co-organize this cycle of events. And I would uh, also uh, thank uh, Professor Peter Spatelf for his availability to share with us the results of research on the Scotch Pine. On behalf of our unit, on behalf of my fellow delegates, I wish you all a good session. We will remain available for any clarification about UFRO and about UNIT. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. So now that we presented the cycle, let's focus on today's webinar. For today's webinar, we looked for a German co-promoter. Uh, more specifically, I need to read this, the Eberswald University for Sustainable Development. Uh, and we are going to focus uh, specifically uh, Scott Spine Management in Central Europe. So this is a Zoom webinar and the audience won't be able to turn on their cameras or microphones, but we do invite you to participate. You are invited to send questions and comments through the Q&A um, icon that uh, I uh, invite you to identify at this moment. So our speaker will be making a presentation and uh, I invite you to make these comments during the presentation because we um, agreed specific times that uh, we make uh, a short uh, uh, pause so that we can uh, introduce a few, a few questions. Um, so the presentation will be sent to you via uh, email. And now I would like to present today's speaker, Peter Spatelf. So he is a professor of applied silviculture at Eberswald University for Sustainable Development. And uh, after having studied forestry sciences in the Freiburg University, he entered the State Forest Service. He finished his PhD in 1997 in the University of Freiburg. And after that, he went to Brazil and he was a lecturer of German Academic Exchange Service at the Brazilian Federal University of Santa Maria. That's why he speaks Portuguese. <laughs> so the three of us can speak Portuguese even though we are uh, addressing you in, in English. So after that, he was a Dean of the Faculty of Forest and Environment at the Eberswald University. And moreover, he is in charge of climate change and forest adaptation with the German Forestry Association. Peter, thank you so much for making the time to share your expertise with us. 
and I invite you to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for introducing me. I hope you can all hear me. So Perfectly. I will now share the presentation screen with you. And uh, I hope you can see me, you can hear me. So it's a great pleasure for me uh, to start with the first a webinar on uh, pine species. So uh, Scots pine will be the focus of uh, the lecture today. And my title is the management of Scots pine for resilience from a central European perspective. And um, uh, just a moment, I have, no, I still have a problem. Ah, okay, now it's working. I will, um, have this lecture uh, today um, and uh, I will uh, remember uh, our um, Ukrainian colleagues and friends. As you may know, we have uh, strong relationships um, from Eberswalde to the National Forestry University of Ukraine in Lviv or Lemberg in German. Uh, and we have a lot of students and friends and colleagues there uh, in this very difficult time. So, um, and I will uh, start um, with uh, some pictures, dear students, dear ladies and gentlemen. When I walk through the forests near Everswalde or in Northeastern Germany, I see many signs uh, of the current practice and the history of Scots pine uh, management. Uh, so uh, these uh, signs of resin extraction, uh, a practice which was common in Eastern Germany until 1990. I see uh, memorial stones such as the stone uh, of uh, Georg Ludwig Hartig, uh, who was the inventor, so to speak, of the large scale shelterwood cutting system and brought this into the pine forests of Eastern Germany at the time. And I see declining Scots pine trees um, as a consequence of the latest heat and drought years since 2015. And what we also see when we walk around near Eberswalde or in the northern German lowlands in the pine forests, we see damaged forests and salvaged areas and the foresters who try to reforest these areas again and to try to re-establish a hopefully more resilient forest for the future. So the outline of today is, uh, I will uh, talk about some basic features of Scots pine forest management in Germany. So ecology, some aspects of growth and the climatic robustness. I will address silvicultural systems of Scots pine forest management. I will lay a focus on um, the question of high value timber production, because I'm a silviculturist and I'm interested in uh, producing um, valuable timber and other ecosystem services. We will uh, discuss with you the question whether Scots pine is an appropriate or a suitable species for continuous cover forestry as continuous cover forestry is worldwide a very important alternative to clear cutting systems. And then I will go ahead with some explanations or some arguments um, for the management of Scots pine forests for resilience. All right, so first let's go ahead and look at this species. You may all know that uh, Scots pine um, is after juniper, the second most frequent conifer species in the world. It invaded in the post-glacial period as one of the first tree species. In Europe, Scots pine forests now exceed 28 million hectares. So they represent 
around 20% of the productive forest area. So a very significant um, tree species. And you can see that it grows from sea level from the Nordic countries to higher altitudes in the Mediterranean region, for instance, but also up to 2,500 meters in the Caucasus. And uh, it's also planted and cultivated in other countries, for example, in Northern America, and there it is called Scotch pine, but we say Scotch pine in Europe. All right. What about the distribution in Germany? So um, in Germany, we have, uh, according to the National Forest Inventory, the last National Forest Inventory from 2012, the next one is under preparation and we will have the data in one year. Uh, after the NFI in Germany, uh, Scots pine has three focal areas. The first is in northeastern Germany, so in the Berlin Brandenburg area or Saxon Anhalt federal state. And then we have a significant Scots pine distribution range in uh, the valley of the Rhine River. And then uh, Bavaria, the center and northeast of Bavaria is a very old area where Scots pine is cultivated. And an interesting detail here, the first artificial regeneration in Germany with Scots pine was direct seeding or sowing already in the 14th century. So in 1368 near Nürnberg, that was the first place where Scots pine was sowed by foresters. So three areas in Germany, and you already imagine or can see these areas are currently quite vulnerable uh, to drought stress and the changing environmental conditions, especially the valley of the Rhine River and northeastern Germany. So what about uh, Scots pine as a species? Um, something you, you may know very well, it's a two needle species. It can uh, grow up to seven, 800 years. So we, we know that from Northern Scandinavia, such old trees, it's wind pollinated. It's normally more niches. Uh, natural Scots pine stands in Germany. Natural stands are quite restricted to extreme sites. For instance, Myers, also shallow rocks and the the soils on these sites and very poor sandy soils. For instance, on sand dunes, we find natural Scots pine. And in Germany, it's around 10 to 20% on the sites we have naturally Scots pine. But um, as, as you know, in forest history in the last centuries, due to cultivation as a result of land use. We have an extension of Scots pine uh, to an area of 50 to 60 percent in some areas of Germany, especially in the northeast. If we go a little bit into ecology, we can see that um, Scots pine, um, the realized niche, so to speak. So the ecological amplitude in terms of the realized niche is near the margins of forests at the dry end or the dry margin and below, you see it on the Ellenberg ecogram and below also on the wet margin. So that means uh, that is something every, uh, each student's each student knows in the first or second semester that the realized niche uh, Scots pine is restricted due to competition of more competitive species such as European beech to these extreme sites. If you look at the physiological amplitudes so or the fundamental niche, you can see that Scots pine would also grow, of course, without competitive tree species or uh, uh, tree species excluded, competitors excluded, uh, in the center 
of uh, normal sites, fresh sites, moist sites, and um, from their nutrient content, uh, very rich sites. So um, that is the ecology of Scottsbine, uh, the, the realized niche. If we look at the successional stage where we find uh, this tree species, we are of course aware that Scots pine is a pioneer species. It's a, an early successional uh, tree species. So it's light demanding. Yeah, it can colonize recently disturbed sites. Um, uh, for example, if uh, competition and uh, grazing pressure is, is low. That is the reason why Scots pine sometimes is, is and was also used for restoration purposes, because it can colonize these very difficult sites. Um, it has a quite uh, pronounced drought tolerance and also a good frost uh, resistance. It's quite undemanding as to site and water supply. So um, it's a light demanding species um, and um, so to speak, um, quite difficult to work with it under continuous cover systems. We will see that later. If we go to more details, the root um, system um, is um, uh, more like a, a hard root or a tap root. So it's comparable to silver fir on the right hand side of the slide. Um, it has uh, tap roots, very extensive, very long. And this uh, leads to the fact that this species can be quite resistant to storm. And it's a species which is enriched to other forest development types or mixtures in order to stabilize these forests, especially uh, it is added to, to Norway spruce and silver fir as a stabilization element. But on more shallow uh, soils, on clay soils, when groundwater level is high, uh, this species can also be vulnerable to storm. So it has two sides. And uh, of course, we must take care Oh, I believe maybe there was uh, some. Uh, okay, the yep. one better. You were okay. frozen for a few seconds. Ah, okay. So I on. hope <laughs> I can go on unfrozen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can see the deformed roots, uh, which should of course be avoided when you plant Scots pine. All right, let's introduce some growth and yield uh, facts. Um, if we look at total production over age, so it's a German figure and you can see total production on the vertical axis over age on the horizontal axis, you can see at the reference age of 100 years uh, in Northeastern Germany, Scots pine yields eight cubic meters per hectare and year. So 800 cubic meters of total production in 100 years. So it's a quite performant tree species, but it's far below, uh, for instance, silver fir and Norway spruce and even Douglas fir as an introduced exotic tree species, which performs very well and is maybe 100% higher than Scots pine in terms of uh, total production. Okay, um, recently many groups, many colleagues at different research institutions and universities were working on the growth and yield of Scots pine in mixtures and the performance of um, this species when it is uh, admixed to other uh, trees or tree species. And I will report um, uh, some um, results here from Hans Bridge, who for a very long time uh, did excellent research and his team at Munich University on this 
uh, effect uh, he calls or is called in the textbooks and in the articles over yielding. Um, and the results um, are stunning. Uh, you can see here the standing volume in mixtures, especially with beach, uh, is more than 12% uh, plus. Um, the stand volume growth is increased compared to the um, the weighted mean of the neighboring monocultures. The explanation is quite interesting. Um, there were many interesting uh, results or research ongoing, how this can be, how there could be such a multiplicative effect and not only the additive effect of two species on their compartments, but it's a kind of emerging characteristic or a multiplicative effect. This is true that uh, in a mixed stand, the uh, packing of the trees per area can be more efficient. So there can be more trees with a specific size in diameter, for instance, per area than in a respective monoculture. So the package of the trees is better and let that leads to a higher yield. So this overyielding is reported in many studies, not only in the combination of Scots pine and beech, but also in the combination of Scots pine and spruce and other uh, combinations. Uh, the, the interesting question, is it dependent from site conditions? So if you do this analysis along a site gradient, Sometimes there are positive results, sometimes there is no influence, but I uh, found one uh, interesting um, correlation. It's here a correlation with the Dematon index. So with decreasing drought, uh, there is a decreasing overyielding. Um, Better <laughs> was a bit frozen. So an okay. Intra okay. okay. Go All on. Right. Sorry. So <laughs> it's froze for the maybe second. it's also uh, it can be seen what what is what is illustrated here. All right. So I go just further on uh, with this relationship again, which shows us the overyielding effect. Uh, you can see on the graph uh, here. Uh, that the productivity and site quality and the species richness is related which, uh, with each other. And the lower the site quality is, the higher is the productivity increase when species are admixed, especially when you go from one to two or three species already. There is a significant effect. And we call this. Um, um, the, the underlying physiological processes uh, is niche complementarity. So there is, especially if you combine light demanding and shade tolerant tree species, there is a complementarity effect uh, on the better site spectrum and on the poorer site spectrum, the physiological uh, background is called facilitation. So two species help each other, so to speak. They facilitate uh, the better uptake of resources and thus uh, it, it comes out uh, uh, such an overyielding effect. Yeah, species, Scots pine. Let's compare it with other pine species. Let's go uh, abroad and look at, at uh, comparable pine species. We have 111 pine species on the world. And in the webinar cycle, further pine species will be addressed and will be, will be explained. And if you go to the fast growing plantation forest sector, for instance, in Southeastern US, Pinus eliotii, Taeda, you have a very fast growing and very performant uh, pine species with yields of 
25, 20 cubic meters per hectare and year, if they are genetically improved, even better. Uh, and if we go to Chile or if we go to uh, New Zealand, uh, we have radiata pine, also uh, a very uh, well growing uh, pine species. So this is plantation forestry in Central Europe. We are in a kind of semi-natural forestry. Uh, in the public discussion, people very often talk about plantations. If they see a pure stand, it's a plantation, but we have to be careful. We have in Central Europe a tradition of, uh, of mixture and we have a tradition of working with natural regeneration. So I would be very careful to use the term plantation. Uh, if you go to the subtropics and tropics, you can see real plantations. If we look at the response of Scott's pine, there is a lot of studies, of course, um, and uh, we should look at three growth parameters, the height, the diameter, and also the yield per area. And what you can see uh, in this thinning response, you see uh, on the horizontal axis, the density. So from a maximum density going down left to a minimum density. And what you can see, if we reduce density in terms of height, we do not have really a response. So it's very, very poor, sometimes not significant. But if we go to diameter, of course, we can see a very strong positive response. This is, of course, we, we do silviculture. We intervene in forest. We, we create more light conditions or better light conditions in a stand by thinning. And this means that especially the diameter growth is accelerated with a heavy or intensive thinning. And in terms of yield, we have a slight negative effect if we reduce density. So we lose a little bit of uh, yield in terms of volume, of cubic meters of volume per area, but instead we gain a lot of diameter increments. So we are able to produce a tree, a thick tree, in a shorter period of time, and maybe we reduce, therefore, the risks uh, to uh, climatic conditions, etc., by doing this. That's an important argument. So this is the thinning response. Uh, it's called Asman's theory. Uh, this is a, a relationship which you can more or less find also with other tree species. All right. Uh, what about pine wood utilization? Let's address it briefly. So um, the pine wood, you can see here a, a, a cross section from our university, is very easily workable and is, is one of the strongest softwoods with a very good strength to weight ratio. The, the wood contains resin and has a, a very good natural durability. So the timber, the pine timber is good for pulp and paper, for fiber boards, it's good for furniture, um, it can be used for building and construction, and it can even be used, of course, for so-called engineered wood. Um, so uh, again, uh, industrial round wood, you can see here on the piles, and here on the right side, you can see a kind of engineered wood. So the glued laminated timber, which allows us to take uh, small dimensions and uh, glue them together uh, to uh, larger entities or larger units uh, for excellent building and construction purposes. Um, I want to tell you just a, a story from Eberswalde, from the former GDR, in terms of resin, in terms of the production of this non wood forest product. Uh, I heard from a 
a forester who was responsible before 1990, uh, 1989 in the former German Democratic Republic. He said that in the state forest enterprise of Eberswalde, there were 70 resin workers who only had the job or the task to extract resin. And they had in the plan the task to extract more than 300 tons of resin per year in one small forest district. So uh, non-timber forest products do not play a very significant role at the moment in German forestry, but uh, in the past, uh, it was much more significant. And in other areas in the world, these non-timber, non-wood forest products are really essential and essential um, ecosystem good uh, which forests provide. If we go to a more detailed analysis of provenances, we can see that uh, some provenances on the left part of the figure are more vulnerable to storm damage. So the bars are the intensity of storm damaged wood. Um, especially the German and the Western European provenances uh, are more vulnerable and the Baltic and the Eastern German and the Latvian uh, provenances are much more resistant to storm damage. That is something we know from provenance trials or common garden experiments. And what we all know uh, from this international provenance trial in Corin near Eberswalde, the quality and the growth of this, these provenances. You can see two provenances, the Baltic provenances, Masuren, uh, it's Poland today. And you can see the French provenances. The French provenances are very, um, uh, bad in quality and also inferior in growth, whereas the Baltic provenances uh, grow very well and have a good quality. On the other hand, recent research shows us that especially the French provenances are very resistant to drought uh, because uh, they have uh, specific uh, substances uh, in, uh, in their tissue, uh, which uh, allows a high drought resistance. So it's a trade-off, as you can see. As provenances can be very good in terms of growth, in terms of quality, but on the other hand, uh, they can be inferior in terms of uh, resistance uh, and uh, susceptibility to climate change factors. We must be very careful in the selection of these provenances. All right. The vulnerability of pine came up really in the last five to six years, especially after the drought event in 2015 in Germany, and of course, after the the uh, cumulative drought years of 2018, 19, 20. Um, and um, we see a lot of damages. The right slide is damages in the Bavarian area. Um, and the left slide is a, a typical insect damage in pure pine stands. And pine, of course, Scots pine and pure Scots pine stands are very susceptible to many insect damages. Uh, so the pine tree lapid moth or gypsy moth, um, and um, they uh, often lose nearly 100 or 90% of their needles and uh, sometimes cannot recover anymore. Sometimes they can. Um, so uh, that is uh, typical for pure Scots pine management. And we today we know perfectly that uh, especially mixture uh, is reducing this risk uh, substantially. If we go a little bit more into this question of uh, susceptibility of pine to drought stress, to negative climatic factors, we have to uh, go to Switzerland first and look at the Swiss results 
in the inner alpine dry valleys from uh, the colleagues there from the Swiss Federal Institute of Snow and Landscape Research and Forestry. We know that uh, pine trees in the inner alpine dry valleys of the valley of the Rhone and the Vinchko, it's in Northern Italy. Uh, we know that pine is declining in the lower elevations and downy oak, Quercus uh, pubescens, is gradually substituting uh, pine there. So we have a kind of um, species substitution um, in a margin area of the pine distribution range. That is what we know from the Swiss colleagues. If we go more into detail in the pine in its uh, physiological properties and characteristics, we have to say it's an isohydric species. So pine responds to drought very quickly with stomata closure. That means it stabilizes, the tree stabilizes its uh, water potential, but on the other hand, uh, it cannot uh, uptake uh, sufficient carbon anymore. That means it is vulnerable to carbon starvation on a mid and long term. Uh, we, we know from these nice experiments in Switzerland, the role of the ground vegetation, the vegetation is consuming very much water um, there. So it has to be uh, uh, removed. The trees um, can be stabilized by thinning. And we know also, uh, excuse me, that epigenetics play a role in the so-called acclimation of trees. So we know this from interesting studies in Switzerland where uh, the offsprings from control trees which were exposed to drought were more tolerant to uh, heat and drought conditions than the offsprings of irrigated trees and they did not have any genetic difference. So there's a kind of epigenetic um, influence um, there, which acclimates trees better to a specific environmental factor. Um, the explanation or the conceptual approach to um, explain the decline of drought is quite well known. So it's the spiral model of tree decline uh, it can be uh, applied also to other tree species, to oak. It's very common, uh, also commonly applied with oak. And you can see there are disposing factors, uh, maybe uh, unsuited sites. There are triggering factors which uh, start a decline process. And then third, there are reinforcing factors. Um, which um, 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 aggravate uh, the declining process. Reinforcing factors, for instance, are the insect calamities. If the trees are stressed by drought, of course, they are much weaker and uh, insects uh, can attack and uh, finally there can be a damage. That is the spiral model of tree decline. Um, yeah. An interesting question concerning pine, also Scots pine, is what is the role of fire in Central European Scots pine forestry? And one could imagine, or one could argue or think that uh, fire could also be a shaping factor or molding factor in pine stands. But this is not the case for Central European natural pine stands, because as I told you, natural pine stands grow on a very shallow, very poor sites. So there is no, um, there is no accumulation of litter, uh, which uh, should be um, kind of burned to release the nutrients in this litter and to start a renewal or reorganization process of the stand. This is not the case in natural pine stands in central Europe in Germany. So fire 
is not a shaping factor, but fire, of course, occurs. Um, uh, the number of fires in principle is uh, slightly declining, but we have some, some special years, of course, 2003, 2018, with a lot of fires, with large scale fires on former military training areas in Germany, where a munition is exploding and is igniting a fire. Yeah? Uh, and such a fire you could see south of Berlin uh, in 2018. Um, and uh, this it's a it's an area with 400, nearly 400 hectares. And it's a, a nice area to study the reforestation process. And there is a, a large research project ongoing there, which is coordinated by a colleague at Eberswalde University to study the aspects of uh, reforestation of natural reforestation, uh, the role of deadwood, um, etc., the role of, of soil scarification and other uh, techniques to, to improve uh, the reforestation. So, with this, I could, as we uh, planned, uh, have a small break and uh, answer some questions if you want. Yes. Yes, I will uh, like to uh, acknowledge that your students are uh, very lucky because uh, your, your presentation is being uh, very clear. <clears throat> um, I totally agree with several of the comments that you made, for instance, that uh, in, uh, in Europe, at least uh, in Portugal, we don't really have uh, plantations and people tend to call it uh, plantations. And uh, I, uh, I agreed with that perspective. We uh, already have um, two uh, comments and questions. I will uh, uh, address them, but uh, I also have some um, uh, questions. I wonder, um, why is not uh, resin um, production, uh, why mm. it has stopped? Because uh, here in Portugal, for instance, and Spain, uh, it is the, the opposite. There is an increasing mm. interest in this. Also, I wonder what is the dynamics for the uh, area? Is the, 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 pine, uh, the Scots pine area um, stable or uh, has it been uh, declining? Mm -hmm. And what is the typical rotation? Sorry to make yeah, you all okay. the questions yes. at the time, but they are, uh, are fast, fast answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, resin. So in, in Western Germany, where I grew up, uh, there was no, I, I cannot uh, remember resin production or resin extraction. Uh, but in Eastern Germany, it was a practice until 1989. And this had to do with the socioeconomic conditions of the GDR economy, which was a, an economy under pressure to produce as much in the own country, so on the domestic market, and uh, not to to be able to import everything. So it was um, it was a typical thing, and uh, the people told me that not only resin production was was a, a typical characteristic of the forest enterprises. They had a specialization in many other things apart from forestry, because they try to produce as much on their own yeah. due to the difficult situation in the general economy. And this stopped completely with 1989, uh, with the, uh, the entering of Eastern Germany onto the German market and the world market and the substitution possibilities. Um, okay, so um, the area of Scotsbein. Yeah. Uh, is declining, oh. is declining, yeah. Uh, in uh, northeastern Germany, we have 50 to 70% of Scots pine forests, uh, the share at the total forest area. And as I told you, 10 to 20% is the natural share. So this share or this amount of Scots pine forest, they will be converted. They are already converted and will be 
further converted in the future into mixed stands. Sometimes we will even uh, abandon Scott's pine in the stands and convert completely into a broadleaf mixed stand when the site conditions are too good. When we mm -hmm. have very rich sites, it's not appropriate to uh, plant or to have Scots pine anymore. So that means it declines and our timber industry is already asking us, uh, will we have enough Scots pine yes. timber that's on one, the market? That's one, that's one of the questions I yeah. had for you because yeah. uh, there's a severe um, uh, wood deficit specifically for uh, um, um, uh, yeah. uh, hard wood, soft wood. <laughs> yeah, the soft wood sector. Yeah. So that is a, a question of wood supply. That is not my primary question as a silviculturist yeah. because my task and my interest is to develop resilient forests for the future. And these are mostly mixed forests. Yeah. And of course, these forests should contain also conifer tree species. We yeah. should not do this fault and uh, substitute all our conifers. So. We have a very fragile species, which is called Norway, uh, uh, Norway spruce, which mm -hmm. uh, is, is very under pressure. We have Scots pine, which started to decline in some areas. And we have Douglas fir, which is under suspect because it's a, uh, an exotic tree species. And Douglas fir at the moment has a share in uh, in northeastern Germany of one to two percent. So it's quite restricted to just a few spots. So mm -hmm. that means we will lose Scots pine, but we should keep some conifer tree species also for stability reasons, but also for, for wood supply reasons. Yeah. And, and all the architects and the wood technologists, they tell you uh, in, in simple words, you cannot, you really cannot uh, um, uh, make a good construction wood out of beech. It yes. has too many difficulties. Yes. We must have conifer or softwood tree species. Yes. So the rotation, the last yes. question, uh, the rotation of Scots pine is 80 to 100, 120 years. Oh, it depends okay. on uh, difficulties with fungies, uh, which may come up uh, at the age of 90, 100, et cetera. Uh, so the rotation is restricted when the target diameter is reached, uh, the foresters start, and that is the, the next slide we will see, start mm -hmm. to regenerate the pine stands by shelter wood cutting or by irregular shelter wood, et cetera. Yeah, yeah? thank you. So perhaps now we can look at uh, some questions in the in the in the in the chat, um, could it be that high density is the uh, answer to drought sensitivity of coniferous sparse stands are in less competition for limited water resources? Is a comment uh, um, about the I believe the the situation in uh, in Switzerland that you were uh, describing? Yeah, so it's it's a comment. Yeah, it's it's not a question. Or yeah, it's a, it a comment. It's I, a comment. Uh, yes, okay. it's a comment. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we also we have, we have a question that uh, high mortality of pine in Germany during a drought in 2018 and 2019 uh, that dropped pulled. Uh, yes, it was responsible for the high uh, uh, mortal mortality. I will guess so. Yeah. So. I'm sorry, but I didn't get the chance to see the the, the comments that people were um, were uh, making during uh, your uh, your answers. So maybe you could go on, and uh, I, we will <coughs> address them in the next uh, break. <coughs> okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> and I will read them. Yeah. Okay. So we go to silvicultural systems now. Um, we have the group of the uneven age systems or the continuous cover forest systems. So with irregular shelter wood and selection forest. And we have the even aged silvicultural systems. And we must say pine, Scots pine is still in many cases 
uh, regenerated with even aged uh, silvicultural systems. So uh, by, by clear cutting, still it occurs. We will see examples by shelter wood cutting. It's still common, not large scale shelter wood cutting uh, with several hectares, but small scale shelter wood cutting and also with strip cutting. So we, we have a, a, a focus still on the even age silvicultural systems. And this is an example of that. Yeah, This is a, a clear cut. Um, in uh, northeastern Germany, in the federal state of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, um, and uh, it's more than a than a hectare, and um, of course we we have um, restrictions, legal restrictions, in Germany in the federal states uh, with respect to clear cut. Normally, a clear cut in Brandenburg, my state where I am working at Eberswalde, a clear cut is. Uh, uh, there, um, when you reduce the stocking volume below 0 0.4 on more than two hectares, yeah, then you have a clear cut. And you, this is not allowed. Yeah? So clear cut is, is restricted, of course, uh, by law, by forest law, and it is restricted also by certification. by forest find methods or even more individual approaches. Um, so that is clear or strip cut. Much more common is shelter wood cutting. You can see it here uh, on this slide, a stand uh, near Eberswalde. Um, we all know the stages in shelter wood cutting. It starts with the establishment cut, and then we have successive shelter wood cuttings and the uh, stocking volume is removed gradually and uniformly over the whole working area in order to promote the natural regeneration in the understory. That is shelter wood cutting. And this system, by the way, was brought to Northern Germany at the beginning of the uh, 19th century by Hartig. Uh, you remember the memorial stone I showed at the beginning. So this is shelter wood cutting. Another popular uh, silvicultural system um, with a Scots pine, or, uh, which is applied in Scots pine stands, is the seed tree system. Now, this is a picture from Norway uh, because the seed tree system doesn't really exist anymore in Germany. Um, it existed in the GDR. There was a kind of seed tree system uh, which had even an agroforestry component in it, but it was abandoned. It doesn't exist anymore. And today the seed tree system, we can see it in Scandinavia. So when 30 to 50 seed trees were holed over uh, in order to provide the seeds for the regeneration. And then after the establishment of the new forest generation, after five to 10 years, the seed trees are removed. What we sometimes find in German forests are holdover trees, but it's not a typical seed tree system. So, and then, Scots pine can also have, as a tree species, can have service functions. We know many systems where trees uh, have service functions. For instance, uh, the mixture of lime and hornbeam with oak in order to provide shade and to avoid the uh, growth of epicormic branches at oak, which is a uh, a factor which is devaluating the timber or downgrading the timber. Um, that is a, a, a trainer species, um, lime and hornbeam, and uh, a service function of uh, Scots pine is also with the nurse crop. When we take 
Scott Spine as an overstory, a temporary overstory. Uh, for instance, uh, in the reforestation activities on large scale clear cuts, uh, where we uh, provide these nurses or these nurse crops, and then in the protection zone, so below the overstory, the target tree species can be planted or can grow, can germinate. Yeah? That is exactly the description of the nurse uh, crop. And uh, the function as a, a pioneer crop uh, of, of Scots pine is very common. So what you can see in these forest conversion activities, you very often see the first generation uh, or even several generations now uh, was Scots pine and now more broadleaf tree species or more other target tree species are uh, planted or introduced under the canopy of these Scots pines. This is the case in many uh, forest stands in Germany where beech and oak were planted or sowed below the canopy of Scots pine. This is an example from Bavaria. Um, and another example I uh, show you from the subtropics, from Misiones in Argentina, um, where uh, a pine species is a, a nurse or a protection shelter for the more valuable uh, mahogany tree species in the understory. So pine has a, a really central role in these uh, early colonizing species on a difficult ground on, uh, in, in areas of a harsh microclimate in order to initialize uh, a forest succession process. When we talk about silvicultural systems, we must mention the retention principle and the retention systems. And I think retention and the introduction of the retention principle or the expansion of the retention principle into different areas of the world is a very good progress because it is a, a nice alternative to clear cutting. Uh, the focus is shifted from the trees to be removed to the trees to be maintained in a, in a stand, so to speak, to be retained in a stand. And when we look at clear cutting, of course, there is zero percent retained trees. If we look at seed tree system, we have maybe five to 10 percent trees in the overstory. And if we look at shelter wood cutting, we have a higher degree of retention. And the retention principle was, for instance, um, introduced in Northern America uh, as uh, a, a very important measure to implement the ecosystem approach, so to speak, to shift from the clear cutting practices to a more ecosystem friendly practice of forest management um, uh, during the 1980s and 1990s of the last century. So retention principle, uh, a very promising approach to um, work more close to nature in forestry. Now let's look a little bit uh, to natural regeneration of pine in northeastern Germany. It's a case study and uh, I show some slides just to uh, give you an impression um, where Scots pine still is cultivated or Scots pine still is grown. Uh, it's on the poor side spectrum. So we have five categories in Brandenburg. It's uh, in the poorest one or two categories. Scots pine is the leading tree species still today. Yeah? And we keep Scots pine, we admix it with other species. And the procedure to renew the stands is by natural regeneration. And natural regeneration very often works. Sometimes there has to be a soil tillage, a slight soil scarification in order to allow the small seedling to 
find access to the mineral soil. So this is uh, important. Um, uh, Scots pine germinates uh, on the mineral soil and to have an abundant natural regeneration, uh, it is good to have uh, really uh, just a small litter layer or even the bare mineral soil uh, on the top. And then it works. You can have um, wonderful Scots pine regeneration. And in the following, you can enrich by planting in this forest district, uh, in South Brandenburg, uh, a private forest owner who enriched his Scots pine mixed stands, totally regenerated naturally. Also the oak and the beech came in naturally, but he enriched it with Douglas fir. So he planted Douglas fir or in wide spacings every 10, 15 meters, some isolated Douglas firs to, um, to add another conifer tree species, which has good characteristics, which is uh, a good species uh, to work in uh, close to nature systems. Uh, it's growing well and it has quite some uh, good characteristics in terms of climate robustness. And um, um, the mixture question. I think we, we are all familiar with the advantages of mixed stands, um, but we all know that mixtures have to be have to be promoted. So we have to very often intervene in forests. Uh, we have to conduct intermediate cuttings to maintain mixtures. Otherwise, in many cases, if we have dynamics among tree species, tree species with less vigor will be overgrown and outcompeted by competitively strong tree species. So we have to do something for mixtures. And that is the reason that why I advocate forest management in order to, uh, to uh, establish climate resilient stance because mixtures we can um, promote with uh, management. And we have different possibilities uh, to uh, create mixtures uh, in a very uh, good textbook uh, written by Jürgen Bauhus and colleagues. You can find all the information uh, ecologically, but also in terms of silvicultural management with respect to mixtures. So you see the uh, naturally um, regenerated stands in Brandenburg with pine on the poorer side spectrum. Uh, it works quite well. I have to uh, add here one fact. It works quite well if deer populations are very low. So in Germany, we have uh, still in many forest districts, we have uh, two high deer populations. Uh, they are not adapted to the habitat structure. So this is uh, still uh, our uh, task and our duty to reduce deer populations to a, a habitat adapted level. Um, it's a long story which cannot be explained completely in this lecture, but um, it, it is a fact in these forest districts, which work successfully with a diverse natural regeneration, they all hunt very efficiently. So they have the deer populations under control. And this is exactly the fact also in this forest district, also a private district south of Berlin. <clears throat> so Natural regeneration of Scots pine, it works. You find several thousands of trees per hectare, yeah? and you are able to select among the young trees, you easily find so-called future crop trees. You can identify, you can release for um, uh, initiating a production of good timber. Uh, that is no problem. We have uh, worked on that also in students, master and bachelor thesis. 
Okay, so with this small um, overview over the silvicultural systems um, uh, and Scotspine management, I go to another silviculturally very significant and relevant uh, topic, which is the production strategies. Um, before we come then at the end of the lecture to ecosystem services and climate resilience, I want to first highlight uh, the process uh, we are in at the moment. So uh, the, we are experiencing a shift from the mass production goal to the goal of high value timber production. Uh, that means our interest is not to produce as many trees as possible per hectare with intermediate diameter, but to produce large trees with a large diameter, thick trees with a very good quality. So this high value timber production strategy is really a competitive advantage of Central European forestry. Uh, I think we are aware that we may not compete compete with um, pulp wood production, uh, with the uh, uh, tropics and the subtropics, and maybe with other areas in Europe. But in terms of high value timber production, we have the tree species, we have the concepts, we have the sites, we have the silvicultural approach, which is continuous cover forestry. So it's a very promising, a very interesting goal. And interestingly, in Germany, we have an association of close to nature uh, forest enterprises. It's called ANW. Interestingly, these forest owners, very often private forest owners, they are very much competed, uh, excuse me, committed to, to high value timber production. And they also use exotic tree species, so Douglas fir. Okay, so the target is the large tree with high value. And um, for uh, managing these stands, we have to remove uh, bad trees, inferior trees in uh, thinning procedures. So the management of pine stands for high value timber production uh, follows this circle of silvicultural practices after having um, regenerated a stand, um, we very often have to uh, intervene in stands in terms of a pre-commercial thinning. That means we reduce the stem number, the density, or we, we make a mixture regulation. So we, we release um, trees under, uh, tree species under pressure or which are may, or may be overtopped that is pre-commercial thinning. And then we, we thin, we have several cycles of thinning of intermediate cuttings. This is contrary to, uh, to the, uh, the direct regimes in plantation forestry in the tropics and subtropics where the trees are planted and after 10 years harvested without intermediate cuttings. And then we, we quite often, not in every case, but sometimes we prune, we artificially prune the trees, the future crop trees, because the removal of branches is essential for producing high value timber. Otherwise, with conifer tree species, it's not possible because conifer tree species, they keep their branches, even if the branches die, uh, get less vigorous, um, they will not fall down and you will have uh, a wood or timber with a very large knotty core if you won't prune them. So that is important. What we don't do, of course, is fertilization. In close to nature forestry in Central Europe, fertilization does not play any role. Uh, and then finally, we have again the harvest and the application of silvicultural systems. So the crop tree concept is um, very helpful to um, 
increase effectiveness and efficiency of forest management. Because if you identify and release future crop trees, you can concentrate the growth on vigorous and qualitatively good trees. Um, you, you will reach the target diameter in a shorter period, uh, which reduces also, by the way, the risks of production. So it's a very effective and efficient measure or approach um, in forest management. You can work uh, in mixed stands with future crop tree selection. So you select different tree species and release them continuously every 10 years. So the intervention cycle in Germany is every 10 years, sometimes every five years. That is future crop tree selection. The selection of a future crop tree is according to vigor and quality in this uh, ranking. And if we then look at the whole concept of high value timber production, we can see that is a two stage concept. You can apply it, by the way, uh, on nearly every tree species, but you have to adapt it in terms of rotation, in terms of pruning, yes or no, but you can adapt this two stage strategy of high value timber production to all tree species in every eco zone in principle, not only in the temperate zones of Central Europe. The first stage has to do with quality. So in the first stage, the focus is on quality. That means the stands are rather dense. That means natural pruning occurs quite easily. Uh, and then we can see which trees may have good qualities and which trees are the most vigorous trees. In the second stage of this very interesting concept, we have to shift our focus and have to release the future crop trees. We give them more standing space. We take out, we remove competitors of the future crop trees. And with that measure, we increase the diameter increment. We accelerate even the diameter increment. Remember the figure I showed to you, the density reduction and the impact on diameter increment. It's a very uh, relevant uh, response, um, which we as silviculturists use uh, when we manage forest stands. So that is the second stage. It's focusing on diameter growth. Uh, and it, it, uh, the people work on the future crop trees, especially. Sometimes they also intervene in the uh, parts in between of the future crop trees, but that is uh, another story. So that is the concept um, of high value timber production, which is applicable also for Scots pine, of course. And what I mentioned that if we uh, work with Scots pine, we have to prune if we want to produce this high value timber. What does that mean high value timber? That means, look at these nice stems here of Scots pine. Uh, these stems are free from knots, free from branches in the basic section of the stem, maybe six to eight meters height. Yeah, They are free from branches. The branches were artificially removed by hand saw, yeah? mostly. And then uh, the trees are released. They are released by the foresters every 10 years. One, two, three competitors are removed. And this accelerates the diameter increment and finally leads to a, a, a very qualitatively very good tree. In uh, Northeastern Germany, we have the experience these trees with that excellent quality, it's in Germany, it's the quality A, they have the, a, a, um, a price twice as high as the normal assortment. So you can generate really a good 
uh, income and a, a good profit uh, with producing high value timber. But we have to admit the percentage of high value timber at the total timber of pine, which is produced in Germany is maybe one or 2%. So there is room for improvement, a lot of room for improvement. So that is high value timber production. And one aspect I also want to um, mention here is, of course, um, it's not uh, only about thinning and releasing trees. We have also uh, uh, to take care about the harvesting and the logging practices. What, what is uh, happening is that uh, we, we quite pay attention uh, uh, while harvesting on the remaining stand and the soil. So it's a kind of reduced impact logging strategy we, we apply. Um, reduced impact logging first means the forest must have roads so that uh, machines can drive into the forest. Uh, harvesters can drive there and the forest, the stands must have skidding lines. So every 40 meters, we have these access lines. The drive over is only permitted on these access lines. So maybe 10, 12% of the stand area is affected by maybe compaction. Yeah, that's right. But this is important to harvest maybe five, six, eight cubic meters per hectare and year, which is the case in Germany. So the harvest intensity is quite high, although we are still below the increment level. So we may harvest 70 to 90% of what is growing in our forests. But it's a quite a high intensity, which is not possible anymore with motor manual systems, only people working in the forest. So a, a certain uh, degree of mechanization is possible. Uh, and what you see here on this slide is a, a really a, a very heavy machine. It's not a standard machine, it's a, a harvester. And this harvester is able to take out the trees standing. So he cuts or it cuts the trees and uh, takes it out standing. And that means without damaging the undergrowth, the underplanted uh, beach, because this stand you can see here is in a phase of uh, conversion into a broadleaf mixed stand. And in order to reduce the damages or to even avoid nearly the damages at the remaining stand, uh, these um, machines are used. So reduced impact logging is, a, is a, whole, a whole package if you want. We must apply in close to nature forestry or in continuous cover forestry. As uh, working in these forests, you must uh, imagine uh, you cannot see very far. You have a lot of understory. You have different tree species. So working uh, in these forests is more difficult. It's more sophisticated, um, but it's, it's necessary to, to manage these forests like this. All right. So here we could have other questions. Um, yes, I. Uh, we have uh, still forty-five minutes. Uh, okay. When I look at the. Okay. Watch I, I I admit I have uh, I am uh, I have uh, a lot of experience in moderating webinars, but usually I already know what the speakers are saying, so I can uh, read the comments at, and the questions at the same time. But I'm finding it difficult to do it now. Mm. I uh, it's quite, it's very interesting what you showed us uh, with this uh, logging system because I was um, when you were uh, speaking about this mixed stands, I was wondering all the time. But uh, how do you uh, uh, um, harvest without managing the other species and uh, uh, without managing the managing? Um, uh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, without, uh, I, I guess my English is a bit. Uh, <laughs> without damaging today. the other species. The, or, the yeah, other species and interfering. The regeneration. Yeah. And uh, you, <coughs> you, you have this uh, system and you also have quite a, a, a flat slope. Uh, for instance, because in some regions, uh, in mountain regions and with the slope, uh, it will be uh, more challenging yeah. to have these kinds of, um, of systems. So what I would uh, suggest is maybe we do take a 10 minute break. We uh, uh, read the comments and the, you may select the questions that we are going to answer after those 10 minutes. And then we uh, will... Uh, We'll uh, go on uh, the further this presentation. Mm -hmm. Will you agree, Peter? That will be fine. Yes. Okay. okay. So five, five to ten minutes is, is okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So see you in Thank ten minutes. Thank you. See you. See you.
so better. Okay. Have you decided with which questions? We have a lot yes. of questions and comments, and this is really interesting. Uh, I think we don't have the time to no. answer. No, I can I can address two or them. three complexes, yes. and then we go ahead. Yes, yeah? but we do we do appreciate the questions yeah. and the comments because they make this much more interesting. And uh, yeah. then we'll and we will have Zoom allows us to have a report of all these comments. So mm -hmm. I invite you to keep uh, uh, making comments. So should should we continue? I um, oh. I suggest that you may uh, answer a few okay. questions <clears throat> okay. and then so, we yeah. continue. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for the questions. I uh, read um, once more the question: Why um, the mortality uh, in Scottsbine was so high? since 2015 and especially 2018, um, et cetera. This is due to exactly this complex Spiral. Yeah. disease um, model or, or yeah. explanation. Uh, uh, so we, we, have, we have several factors. It's, it's not mono uh, factorial. So we have several factors. We can have a a triggering factor, which is heat. Um, we know that especially in some areas of Germany, 2015, there was extreme heat um, temperatures, more than 40, 41 degrees. So uh, Scottsbine is, is not able to cope uh, physiologically anymore with that heat. Uh, and then it's a triggering effect. Uh, the trees are losing vigor. And then of course you have all the biotic um, damages uh, which occur. So insect damages uh, attacking or insects attacking less vigorous trees. And uh, then other um, factors are coming on top. For example, yeah. mistletoe. Mistletoe is a um, a plant which, which is also known from Switzerland as a reinforcing factor for damage of pine trees. And we observe the same in, in other parts of Germany. So it's a complex uh, disease process, um, which finally leads to mortality. And interestingly, we can see if we look into the tree rings, if we make a, a dendro ecological analysis with yeah. tree rings, we can see declining trees very often or dying trees have also very small tree rings, five, 10, until 15 years before dying. They are already in a, in a decline process yeah. in terms of tree ring width. So that is the, the declining question. Another interesting question was, and we will have this also, in the upcoming slides, is pine as a species, uh, can pine grow for a long time in the understory of, of a stand? Um, that is a difficult uh, question. Normally we, we know that shade tolerant tree species, they have this capacity. So we know from silver fir, silver fir can uh, stay under the canopy of an old stand for 50, for 100 years, um, growing with very small tree rings, uh, nearly visible anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then after release, growing normally again. This is the capacity of shade tolerant tree species. It's uh, a, an essential capacity in a selection forest, in a truly uneven age forest where you have a structured a canopy with uh, trees in the understory with medium sized trees, etc. For pine, this is more difficult. I would say, and I bring some examples, if we have a, a, a mature stand with a low stocking volume, so quite a so called open stand, uh, maybe with one or 200 cubic meters per hectare only. Then we have uh, enough light coming through the canopy in the understory also to, uh, to allow 
young pines to grow and to survive. Yeah. That is a, a kind of um, adaptation of uh, a silvicultural system uh, which normally works better with shade tolerant tree species. So that was an, uh, an example. And then the question eucalypt plantations in central or uh, in Western Europe. Of course, if I look at Portugal, I think you have 20, 25% of, of eucalyptus globulus as a as an exotic tree species, and I would say these are plantations. Yeah. FAO defines plantations as regular stands, mostly uh, with one species or two spe species, maybe with regular spacing, um, which have uh, very often short rotations. So these are plantations. and. Uh, Eucalyptus yes. globulus the point, uh, Yes, the point uh, wasn't, to deny, wasn't to deny that we have the plantations in, in Europe. It was mm -hmm. The point was that sometimes we call semi-natural forests plantations. Yeah. Yes. Semi-natural is a kind of uh, attempt to, to, Flexible. <laughs> to, to establish a category between yeah. real exactly. plantations and and natural forests. Yes, so exactly. semi-natural, this was introduced by FAO, I think 20, 30 years ago, uh, to address this problem that we have forests which have may have one species, but already have elements of We We lost better. Again, let's expect natural regeneration invented. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then there was uh, one question. Maybe uh, was when can we select future crop trees? This is an important question. Yeah. Uh, you can select future crop trees when you can identify vigor with respect. Uh, vigor of a tree with respect to its neighborhood and the quality of a tree. So uh, in a kind of advanced stand stage, we can see how is the differentiation in a stand, um, where are the social classes maybe, and where are the vigorous trees with respect to its neighborhood, and where are the less vigorous trees. And this is normally uh, at heights of 10, 12 meters above. So we select future crop trees when trees have attained heights more than 10 meters normally. Yeah. It's, That's interesting. It, That's interesting yeah. because uh, here in Portugal, we select trees from a natural regeneration stands in maritime pine quite earlier. Ah, and, okay. uh, you, you definitely yeah. can tell uh, which are the more vigorous trees. So that, uh, that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, this is already a quite early selection. And uh, some uh, people who uh, criticize uh, future crop tree concept, they say it's a determination which is too early because we cannot, we cannot be sure that a, a very early determined tree as a future crop tree will survive on a long term, yeah? because we have mortality reasons. different risks as growing trees and the qualitatively best trees, but especially the most vigorous trees, they keep their advantage in terms of growth for a long time. So they do not suddenly decline. They just decline, of course, if there is a natural hazard as yeah. a, a lightning or so, or a, 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 a biotic attack, but normally they keep their advantage and they further grow very well. Oh. And that is the reason why we should select uh, very vigorous trees and by the way, also qualitatively good trees. All right, uh, I think these were some yeah. of the yeah. questions. And if you allow, I could 
go ahead. Yes. And then we have a final uh, session for questions at the end. Yeah. Yes. Because we we, oh, we have just uh, maybe 30 or 40 minutes left. Yes, but okay. uh, there are a few slides that uh, we agreed that you perhaps yeah. could speed up. So okay. Maybe. May I can? Maybe I can shorten also a little bit. Yes, go ahead. Um, okay, so, yeah, just a moment. Yeah. Now, um, the question of forest conversion. So how should we go ahead with conversion? And uh, we, we must first uh, acknowledge that forest conversion is already ongoing in Germany and in other countries also. Um, especially these countries which have a, a gap or a difference between, between the, the natural forest cover or the potential natural forest cover and the, the really existing forest cover. And Germany has a lot of spruce stands and has pine stands and we have still, according to the, uh, the last national forest inventory, we have um, uh, 25 percent uh, pure stands in, in Germany. So we have still the um, obligation to convert our forests into mixed stands. So the task is quite easy. We must come from the pure pine stands to stands mixed still with pine, if pine is a site adapted tree species, but uh, um, mixed also with especially broadleaf tree species because the broadleaf tree species, the beech and the oaks, they, um, they are very important in terms of the potential natural forest cover. Yeah? Uh, most of the land in Germany would be a beach dominated forest. So the potential natural vegetation, if human intervention would immediately stop, would be a beach dominated forest on many sites in Germany. So beach is very competitive under the current climatic conditions. That means that beach is a, a natural tree species, of course, for the future mixed stands of um, um, or after forest conversion. Forest conversion is a, an interesting story. There was a landmark study done by EFI some years ago, uh, the question of uh, forest conversion, the book was called. And what you can see is the trajectories um, for forest conversion. And um, what we uh, have to say that in Germany in 19, 13, the relationship of conifers to broadleaf tree species was 70 to 30. So um, we had quite an extensive period of conversion of the broadleaf forests of the Middle Ages and before into conifer forests during the whole period of settlement, of industrialization, etc., which is a longer story. We cannot comment on this. Um, but we can see uh, the development lines, the red lines from natural forests to cleared land and uh, the dotted line from natural forests to secondary forests of spruce and pine. And then we have also the green line, the conversion back of these secondary forests. And that is the correct term. The pine and the, the spruce forests in Germany uh, are secondary forests. We can call them secondary forests. And they are already since several decades are converted back into more mixed and more natural stands. And that is exactly the task, which of course must uh, go further on due to climate change. But it started already uh, 1980, 1990, due to the, uh, the insight in the, uh, the susceptibility uh, of, of these pure stands to all the kind of risks 
and problems and damages we, we all know. Yeah. So that is a forest conversion. Um, and um, this is a stand which was for a very long time the mainstream forestry in Germany. So uh, even age stands, um, pure stands, uh, especially in North Eastern Germany, Scotspine stands and in Southern Germany in the, the mountainous areas, spruce stands. So these were the, the, the mainstream stands and especially in the GDR, in the period of the German Democratic Republic, um, the focus was laid nearly exclusively on the maximiza maximization of volume production. So especially in the 1960s, 70s, in the GDR in Eastern Germany, it was essential for the foresters to produce as much timber as possible. Um, and this was done in pure stands, sometimes clear cut it on areas more than 20 hectares. Uh, so large scale clear cutting and then planting um, with very high numbers of trees. So maybe 20,000 and more young seedlings per hectare. So that was the mainstream forestry in the middle of the 20th century, especially also in Eastern Germany. Yeah, and uh, an interesting slide which I can show you here is uh, a regeneration uh, of, um, uh, of uh, broadleaf trees or the admixture of broadleaf trees, which was practiced already in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century. And you must look in the foreground, the old beaches in the foreground is a group which was um, established in a pure pine stand at the end of the uh, 19th century uh, in a kind of patch cutting. And that was an early attempt uh, already at the end of the 19th century to uh, convert pure stands into mixed stands or to establish a mixed tree species component in the north, northern German uh, uh, forest stands. Yeah? So beech was introduced in these patches and we can still uh, see them today. They grew quite well and have uh, normal quality. So it was quite successful, this method. Um, and um, uh, what is um, very important as a technique, as a silvicultural technique uh, today uh, of conversion is the uh, so-called underplanting. We call it underplanting. Um, it's either artificially by really planting uh, groups of beeches or oaks, for example, or rows under the canopy of a stand to be converted, or it is working with natural regeneration. Of course, we all know natural regeneration only works if the seed sources are available. So if mother trees are in the neighborhood, uh, if beeches or other broadleaf trees are uh, available, fine, but very often we can also wait for seed dispersal by birds, for example, by the jay, the European jay uh, is, is very uh, important as a, a seed disperser. So we, we have many stands in Northeastern Germany where especially oak is accumulated in the understory as a natural regeneration which comes from far distances uh, and the dispersal is done by the J. Very interesting and a very close to nature approach. Uh, so we have these two um, types of underplanting and natural regeneration. Um, that is beech, which is underplanted. It's the small figure or the small slide uh, left and the oak, which was dispersed by the jay. 
And um, with this strategy, many forest owners and especially the state forest uh, enterprises, they work with natural regeneration uh, to convert these large pine forests. And also additionally with planting, with underplanting. Just to give you an example how expensive such a forest conversion uh, measure is, uh, imagine the conversion of a pure Scots pine stand into a mixed stand. We introduce three groups of beech and one group of silver fir with a, a size of 0 0.1 hectares in a hectare yeah, under the canopy of Scots pine in a spacing of two by two meters. We need a protection fence because a deer population very often is not um, low enough. Yeah? So browsing intensity is still high and to avoid browsing, one measure is fencing as we all know. And soil scarification is sometimes necessary to, to eliminate the thick litter layers and to facilitate the germination of the pines. So what are the costs of such an hectare of underplanting? Um, I gave you an example uh, here, 6,000 euros per hectare. So you see, forest conversion is quite expensive. And uh, um, to, to go into the future of these climate resilient stands, requires costs and investments. It's not for free. Of course, we can work as close to nature as possible with natural regeneration, but sometimes the target species are not available and then we have to plant. So it's an investment into resilience forests of the future. We must take, and especially the forest owners must take. And for the non-Germans uh, in Germany, we have a high sector of private for or a, a large sector of private forest owners. So in some federal states in North Rhine-Westphalia, we have 60, 65% of private forest owners, sometimes small scale private forest owners. And we have to help the private forest owners uh, to to realize this investment, especially to convert the forest and to reforest the damaged areas. And at the end, we can may discuss some of the measures uh, which are discussed at the moment in forest policy. So um, an interesting approach to, um, to manage an uneven age stand is shown in this slide. So forest conversion, ladies and gentlemen, is not only about mixing. Forest conversion very often is also about converting even age stands into uneven age stands and into truly uneven age stands. That means a mixture of different age classes or trees of different ages on a small area. And we all learn, uh, we, we foresters uh, learn that a, a basic characteristic of a truly uneven age stand is the negative J-shaped diameter distribution curve. You can see uh, in the slide left above. So a truly uneven age stand has many small trees and then a few uh, medium sized trees and very few large trees uh, intimately mixed among each other. That is a selection forest or a, a truly uneven edge forest. And conversion can also have to do with conversion into uneven edgeness. And a, a very good approach here is the basal area a diameter Q approach, which is extensively described in the forest growth and yield and silvicultural literature. What you need is the basal area of the target stand, so the stand after intervention, and you need the Q factor, and the Q factor is the division or the relationship between the numbers of trees of two subsequent uh, uh, diameter classes. 
Um, so the Q factor shapes the curve. If you uh, have um, a Q factor of 1.2, you have a relatively flat curve. If you have a Q factor of 1.6, you have a relatively steep curve with a lot of young trees and small trees. Yeah. So with the basal area after intervention with a, a Q factor and with the maximum diameter you want to achieve, you can um, establish a target structure of your stand and you can derive the trees, the number of trees and the diameter classes where you have to intervene. So where the red arrow is uh, in this slide, in this example, we have to intervene in order to come to the target diameter curve. That is an interesting uh, concept. Maybe it's, it's too fast to, to be explained, but if you are interested in, in you can go to the, bio, uh, to the basal area diameter Q approach for managing uneven age stands. Again, I want to highlight the basic uh, precondition for every close to nature forest management system, every uh, forest conversion, which should be successful at the end. You must keep deer population under control. And when, when, I, when I came to our friends in Ukraine, in Viv, to my colleague at the Ukrainian National Forestry University, he showed me some wonderful forests and he told me we really have no deer browsing. So the deer population there is so low that they can work with natural regeneration without any protection measures. So fences uh, are unknown in Ukraine. Yeah? But fences were still uh, a practice for a long time in Germany in forestry and in some parts until today. So the deer population uh, there are interesting uh, economic studies. Germany is losing more than uh, 90 million euros per year as opportunity costs because young stands are browsed and damaged and have to be re-established again by planting or substitution of the damaged plants. So we have enormous costs or losses every year in Germany, uh, more than 90 million per, per year. Um, and we have to solve this problem. Otherwise, the trajectory into the future of close to nature and resilient stand is uh, a very hard tra trajectory and very costly. Close to nature, silviculture has a long history, and I could highlight several points here, um, which I cannot in this lecture, but uh, there are interesting uh, articles uh, on that. I just want to highlight Alfred Möller because he is key to Eberswalde. Uh, he was the director of our higher forestry education institution in the 1910s and 20s until 22 uh, and he was so to speak the the inventor or the promoter of continuous cover forestry so in germany continuous cover forestry goes back essentially uh, on uh, alfred Müller. Um, and on, on the right side i uh, put some elements of close to nature forestry or continuous cover forestry you see, it's not a it's not a single silvicultural system. It's a whole program. It's a philosophy, if you want. It's an approach. Um, it is it is about uh, a selection of tree species of the natural forest cover, creating mixed stands, working with natural regeneration, uh, reducing damages on soil and the remaining stand, retaining stand legacies as dead wood, etc. So that is that is the core program of all close to nature silviculturists, which are together in Pro Silva in Europe, you know this, yeah? Pro Silva is the European um, association of close to nature silviculturists or forest owners. Um, and uh, 
let's go back to pine and the question of continuous cover forestry. And uh, Müller, when Müller came back from Brazil, because Müller was uh, especially working on fungi, he was a mycologist. He was in Brazil in the 1880s and then came back from the subtropical forest of the German colonies of South Brazil. He came back to Prussia and then he saw the pure pine stands and he had in his mind the structured uh, and highly diverse subtropical forests in South Brazil. And then he developed step-by-step step his philosophy of, of continuous cover forestry. And he found a model, he found a forest district, South Berlin in Sachsen-Anhalt, where a forest owner practiced continuous cover forestry or a kind of continuous cover forestry in pine stands. It was Friedrich von Kalic, which you can see on this stone. And um, this forest district still today um, is managed by the state forest enterprise of Sachsen-Anhalt, a province in Germany. And they still want to uh, maintain a kind of structured pine forest. But as I told you, uh, continuous cover forestry, the maintenance of pines in the understory of a closed stand is, is not possible or is very difficult. So you must have open stand situations. So low standing volumes in the overstory. And then you can work also with a more structured or a multi-layered pine stand. It is possible. And this is done here in Bärentoren, which is this model forest uh, ownership uh, for Müller in the 1920s of the last century. <clears throat> and you can see uh, nicely structured uh, pine stands where the people today work with uh, natural regeneration. Um, we have uh, we uh, see here our students from Eberswalde uh, several years ago making an excursion uh, to that forest district. You see uh, large pine trees, hold over trees together with medium sized pine trees and patches of pine regeneration. So maybe it's not a, a completely uneven age stand tree by tree, but it's a patch wise uneven age stand where you have patches of regeneration and you have medium sized trees and you may have single or group wise larger trees in these stands. So it is possible um, uh, continuous cover forestry, maybe not in the ideal form, not in the intimate mixture, but in a patch wise, in a group wise mixture. That is Bärentoren. You see, there is also uh, at mixing uh, with uh, beech, with other tree species. So these are stands which may be more resilient for the future, uh, for these new times which already have come to us um, than the previous uh, pure and even age stands. And um, with this, I want to go to my last chapter today, uh, which is um, the question of how to develop resilient pine forests for the future. And uh, what about the other ecosystem services? It's not only about producing valuable timber or a softwood uh, for pulp and paper. It is also about diverse ecosystem services. And uh, I want to address some, some basic aspects here. The robustness of pine in terms of climate is already addressed. So you can see here the climate envelope um, of Scots pine for Germany. You see the species range of Scots pine in blue. And then you see a pattern, the clim climate of Germany now. And you see in red, the climate of Germany in the future. 
and what we can see at the warmer end um, of the future climate, but also uh, uh, under humid uh, conditions at the warmer end, we have a gap or we have no overlay of these two envelopes. That means uh, we have may face problems or more severe problems with our pine trees. So that is exactly the explanation with a species distribution model, what a very simple model, the climate envelope model, uh, why we have these difficulties with pine tree species already in the inner alpine dry valleys and more and more also in the central distribution range of pine in Northern Germany, for example. Okay, if we now um, look at silviculture and ask ourselves how we can um, make our forests more resilient, how we can increase the adaptive capacity. Uh, I think uh, it is an appealing uh, model to look at the stages of development of forests and to see where we can intervene. And I hope you agree with me that a central stage um, in forest management is the regeneration stage. And in the regeneration stage, we can especially manipulate or change the future forest composition and the structure by introducing new species. Um, just a moment, by um, help the minor tree species with low vigor in the stand, by uh, introduce maybe uh, foreign tree species um, from other continents. I will go to that in a few minutes. So the regeneration stage is essential in this uh, conversion process we are at the moment. So we have to be very careful and uh, look at the species composition, but not only that, we also have the task to, to uh, promote or to, to build resilient ecosystems. So that, that is a, a very difficult discussion, um, a discussion which is at the moment ongoing in Germany. Um, I think maybe also in other countries, which ecosystems are the most resilient ecosystems? Basically, are these ecosystems which are managed, so where active management occurs, or are these ecosystems where the forest is left to grow? So that is a, a current discussion, I think, in many countries in Europe, and it's uh, also uh, addressed by the European Commission uh, or Euro the European Union in its biodiversity and forestry strategy. But that is another story for another webinar. So the regeneration stage is crucial, but we have also options in the intermediate stage. And we can use thinning. Thinning is seen to be an appropriate measure to, um, to facilitate the resource uh, distribution to the remaining trees. Because if we remove trees, we uh, improve the water conditions for the remaining trees. And there are uh, already several meta studies available which show that thinning of Norway spruce, of Scots pine has a positive effect. Um, on uh, drought resistance and resilience. I show an example in a few minutes. And then we come again into the final stage and the initiation of a new forest stand. So what, what we did in a European project, in a cost project several years ago, we analyzed many authors from uh, Europe, uh, we analyzed whether the existing concept of close to nature is a suited concept also with respect to climate change. So do the 
<coughs> close to nature principles match with the adaptation principles. And what we found out in summary is yes, uh, to a high degree, they match. Uh, so we can work with species richness and structural diversity, which is good both for close to nature forest stands or forestry, and also for enhancing resilience. The genetic diversity is essential for both goals. Um, the resilience and resistance of uh, individual trees is essential for both goals. Uh, so we have with close to nature silviculture, with this approach to work with mixed stands, to work with natural regeneration, to, uh, to reduce damages at the remaining stand, um, to, to emulate um, old growth attributes with deadwood, etc., with large and old trees. We have an excellent concept in principle uh, to cope with climate change. That is my conviction. And uh, we uh, try to, to analyze this uh, in, in some uh, project activities. Um, and the, the core elements of this resilience, um, I want to highlight just two is first, functional diversity. It's called functional diversity. What does that mean? It's not only diversity of the ecosystem, it's the diversity in functional traits of an ecosystem. So that means the combination of light demanding species and shade tolerant species, the combination of fast growing species and slow growing, the combination of deep rooting species and shallow rooting species. That means to bring together diverse range of functions of traits to be able to cope with diverse um, impacts of climate change and even to have these traits more than once so a redundancy of of these traits, so and 19. That is one point, and this, um, uh, this uh, goes together with the principle uh, which is uh, described in uh, civic culture and ecology of ecological insurance. So what we do if we mix stands, if we have different functional traits, if we have a redundancy of these traits, we increase the e ecological insurance of our forest stands to uh, damages or to risks. And the second point um, here in this respect is um, we should be open at least for introducing tree species from other continents or from other areas. Um, the term which is very uh, often in use here is assisted migration. We know that the natural migration may not fast enough, may not be fast enough. Um, so that we assist the migration of different provenances from other provenance areas of a tree species, uh, of tree species from other, even other continents to um, improve or increase the diversity of our stands and to increase this um, diversity of functional traits. That is assisted migration. You see the three uh, aspects. It's the assisted population migration, so the expansion of populations uh, northward, for example, in Europe due to warming. Yeah? And the second is the assisted range expansion, ARE, so that uh, a species range can expand due to uh, the, uh, the change of the climate. And the third is the assisted species migration, which is the introduction of a species from a completely different area, or even a continent. And I put three examples here with respect to Scotspine. Uh, 
assisted species migration would be, and this is already done, for example, the introduction of ponderosa pine in Brandenburg yeah, as, a, as another uh, pine species, maybe more, uh, more um, uh, uh, robust against climate change. Yeah? Uh, range expansion is the uh, expansion of a species out of its normal range, which already was done in Germany with Scots pine for many decades. And also the provenance question we have to see. We can use provenances from uh, areas which were already uh, influenced for longer time by higher temperatures, by less precipitation, and take these more adapted ecotypes uh, and introduce them into our forests. So this is uh, assisted migration together with functional diversity, I think uh, a key element for resilient forests for the future. And if we uh, look at thinning, the second point I want to highlight from these silvicultural measures, you can see that thinning is really proven to be a measure to enhance uh, resilience and resistance. And one uh, common approach here, which is done very often, is the analysis according to Loré. So the resilience and resistance according to Loré. Um, you can see here a study with Scott's pine and the preliminary result. Um, you can see uh, the growth performance before uh, the drought event. That yeah, drought event was 2003. And then you can see the curves uh, in different years, how they recovered after drought. Um, and what is the influence of thinning? And what we can see is a low resistance uh, in 1976 and 1991 but higher resilience at young ages, the resilience is the recovery. So species may not be very good in resisting, but they come back to, uh, to uh, the former growth level and they recover. Um, but we can also see that uh, with uh, um, subsequent drought years, the resilience is declining here. So the resilience was quite good at the beginning at younger ages, but is declining with more and more drought years, which is a, a hint uh, that uh, uh, the whole system may not be so robust. That leads me to my final considerations. Um, and that is um, how can we uh, cope with these uh, damaged areas, which we see, uh, especially also here in Germany. This is a slide from uh, an area between uh, Berlin and Leipzig, uh, where uh, Scotspine stands, sometimes pure, sometimes a little bit mixed, were heavily damaged due to the consecutive droughts in 2018 to 20. And uh, now we have clear cuts because or cleared areas because there was salvage cutting. Yeah, the people tried to salvage a uh, uh, large part of the timber. And the huge question now is how can we uh, make reforestation? And I would take the term here, restoration. It's really a, a, an activity of restoration, what, uh, which we have to do here. How can we restore these areas? Should we leave nature alone? Uh, should we wait and uh, hope that nature is the best, the natural development is the best pathway? Or should we actively uh, intervene into these areas and invest? Uh, which tree species should we plant? Uh, should we um, uh, combine natural succession with planting? In which degree, how long should we wait for natural success, success, succession? Excuse me. So 
these are exactly the questions many forest owners have at the moment when they try to restore these areas. And I just give you some slides and some, some ideas on that. Um, of course, for, for the state forests, there are some rules, some principles, how these forests should be restored. Of course, they should be restored by mixtures, mixed stands, and pine will reduce. Um, we will have more broadleaf trees. Maybe we will still have some pines in these stands, but not, not as much as uh, in the past. The preferred technique is natural regeneration, if it works. Sometimes uh, we must uh, assist with soil preparation, soil scarification. Um, and we have also to uh, consider already in this stage measures of nature conservation. For example, forest margins, diverse uh, species composition at forest margins, um, habitat trees, uh, etc. keeping dead wood on the ground, etc. So these are the principles of reforestation after damages under very difficult conditions. Um, and if you look at these uh, uh, sites, you can see this is a form of forest. So this is a forest with, which was damaged in nine, uh, 2018, 2019, and then salvaged. And now it's the time after the, according to the forest law, after three years um, to reforest a stand again, to, um, to plant, uh, if there is no natural regeneration. And that is very difficult. So the obstacles are obvious. It's grass, yeah? uh, thick grass layers. It's uh, mice, for example, or insulation, high radiation, uh, a harsh microclimate, especially for late successional tree species, beech, etc., silver fir. They cannot be planted on large open areas due to frost sensitivity. Um, so it's heat. So these are really difficult conditions, but it's my conviction that in these areas, if we want to have forests, we have to invest and have to actively uh, manage these areas. Um, of course, to use the natural uh, possibilities, but we have to actively manipulate or manage these areas in order to, to um, initialize uh, a forest development for more resilient stands here. So if we wait, we can expect something, of course. We will expect, for example, pioneer species such as aspen. Uh, aspen is very common on these areas, aspen or birch. But what about the, the target tree species? Of course, we could, we could be satisfied with an aspen stand uh, on a mid-term, on a long-term, but what about uh, stands maybe with uh, more diverse ecosystem services? So um, it's a question of soil preparation as soft as possible, but as intensive as necessary. Um, and uh, uh, what we should, uh, of course, consider is uh, to leave legacies, uh, to leave elements of the former stand. So dead trees, standing dead trees, or coarse woody debris, so lying dead wood. These are important elements for safeguarding biodiversity in these areas. So deadwood is um, highly acknowledged as a, a magnet of, of, of diversity of different insects. There are interesting studies that hundreds of insect species are especially dependent on deadwood. Um, so this is important that we, that we identify site-adapted individual uh, solutions for these areas, of course, with some principles, 
but uh, site adapted solutions. And experts or very experienced people, they say every large scale damaged area is a single situation. Yeah, so we must uh, look really at the site conditions uh, in the area. Okay, that means that we uh, will also work, and that is my, uh, my pledge, that we also should take into account exotic tree species, not on a large scale, but sometimes as groups, as admixtures in stands with native tree species, because these species can include uh, additional traits in these forest ecosystems. So that means uh, Scott's pine management is not only about producing pulpwood or valuable timber production. Uh, Scott's pine management can be very attractive for uh, restoration purposes, that is the fixation issue. Scott's pine management can be interesting for non-wood forest products such as mushrooms or berries. And there are nice studies about that. Um, the uh, admixture of broadleaf trees is very essential for the water household, for the infiltration rates. Uh, to the groundwater in these areas. Um, and uh, Scott's pine forest can be uh, important for carbon storage, of course, and we can, we can optimize carbon storage in pine stands together with the product storage pool. So we know that we have three pools, the forest pool, and then we have the products pool of carbon stored in a durable product. And finally, we have the substitution of more carbon intensive products by wooden products. So we have this whole issue. Um, we have the biodiversity issue. So uh, it is clear that um, these diverse ecosystems or these specific ecosystems, they come not automatically uh, with the production of timber. Remember, that was uh, to emphasize where we want to produce, where we can uh, uh, provide other ecosystem services where we lay an emphasis on biodiversity, et cetera. And this is possible and we have the concepts for this. And uh, many of us may remember that a uh, few years ago, there was a um, activities to describe and to go into detail into a concept which is called integrative forest management. The IFM, Integrative Forest Management, uh, there was an EFI project called Integrate, uh, which was the basis of that uh, final book, which was published. And Integrated Forest Management is a concept where you can provide different ecosystem services uh, while keeping uh, an emphasis on production. So while actively manage uh, forests, but with uh, the uh, consideration also of non-managed uh, areas, uh, smaller non-managed areas of five or 10%, of course, there's room for these elements in such an integrative forest management strategy. So that is my, my conclusion at the end. Before I really come to the end, I just want to mention, of course, uh, there are alternative pine species suitable for our stands in Europe. Uh, they are already here. Here and we were pine on on restoration areas in the mining area in southern uh, Brandenburg, for example. 
Um, and in the alpine areas, we have uh, different pine species in the, in the close to nature forest there. So I want to close with uh, some basic messages, take home messages or conclusions um, concerning Scots pine. It's a very important conifer tree species in Europe, in the forests of Germany. Uh, it has pioneer species characteristics. It is less competitive and thus restricted to um, marginal sites under competition. Yeah? Um, it is uh, normally uh, quite robust, but becoming more and more susceptible to uh, pests, to uh, drought uh, in the last year. So, um, and we have to acknowledge that also Scots pine is it's a main tree species in Germany that belongs to the species uh, which uh, came under under stress in the last years. And um, yeah, that is that is something we have to admit. Um, the future of Scots pine management is not in pure stands, not on large areas not regenerated with clear cut and planting, but um, in mixture with oak and beech, regenerated with natural regeneration, maybe enriched with exotic species such as Douglas fir. Um, we should uh, keep in mind that Scots pine can be a, a timber, can be a valuable product. So it's not only uh, uh, pulp wood, of course, we have this coupled production in forestry, but uh, high value timber production can be an interesting, econo economically interesting option for private or other forest owners. God's pine is difficult to be managed in continuous cover forest systems, but it's possible. So I think, uh, of course, God's pine has a, has a good future or has still a future in forestry in Germany, but uh, it is a species which will be uh, gradually reduced. That is uh, at least a fact. So with these um, um, take home messages, maybe I want to thank all of you for your participation, for your interest uh, and uh, I hope uh, that we uh, have further interesting uh, pine webinars and I'm still here uh, available for some questions. But first of all, I thank you very much for your interest and for your patience. Thank you. We, we thank you for uh, your uh, generosity for sharing all this knowledge. And uh, this presentation was not only a compact overview of uh, uh, Scots pine in Central Europe, but I would argue that um, Peter presented us to the most important uh, debates and conversations that we are currently <coughs> having uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, it was uh, interesting for me as a forester focused on pine, how almost you were apologizing for having pure stands and pure um, conifer stands. And uh, I do believe that in order for us to have a more resilient forest, we do need to have uh, to diversify. And that is definitely uh, the way as you have shown us because it has both uh, economic and also ecological uh, advantages, but uh, also this uh, pioneer robust species will always have a key role in a world where increasingly we have disturbances, right? And so they will play uh, an important role in, um, in restoring uh, ecosystems. I, I was reading uh, the, cost, the, the questions and the comments, and uh, most of them were really commenting, even though some okay. uh, in the form of uh, questions, but uh, most of all uh, comments that made it um, the conversation even more interesting. So I'm Thank not you. sure if you um, agree, but uh, 
maybe we can we can uh, uh, end the webinar since yes. we are already half an yeah. hour yeah. Af uh, after the schedule that yeah. we had advanced. So I would like to thank all of our audience. You will be receiving soon uh, Peter's uh, presentation and also a link for the recording so that you can review again this uh, webinar. Uh, I, I thank also you, Fru, and uh, uh, thanks you for being here. And uh, please uh, let us know if you are interested in this webinar cycle. We will invite you for uh, uh, the future uh, webinars in these cycles. So thank you very much to all of you and see you soon. Bye. Thank you.